he has a lot of great ideas. He's not a stupid man. He's worth $9 billion. I feel like our country is going down the drain. He's actually a very intelligent man who cares deeply about America. There is no question that this is the person who will go to Washington, D.C. and be able to absolutely turn the place around. Hello and welcome to TrumpCast, the show about the national emergency known as Donald Trump. I'm Jacob Weisberg, and I'll be here until the crisis passes. Could be in July, could be in November, could be 2025, though I seriously hope not. This is the third week we've been doing the show, and Trump continues to search for the bottom of the barrel in American politics. Yesterday, Trump's thuggish campaign manager, Corey Lewandowski, was arrested and charged with battery in Jupiter, Florida, after allegations that he manhandled, and I think that word is totally appropriate here, Michelle Fields, a female reporter from a right-wing news organization that's actually in the tank for Trump, Breitbart.com. Any other candidate would have rushed to employ Trump's catchphrase, you're fired. Instead, Trump defended his flack and accused the reporter, Michelle Fields, of faking her injury. Maybe those bruises on her arms were already there. On Twitter, Trump complained that Fields touched him and claimed that she was menacing him with a dangerous object. She was holding a pen. I think we're starting to understand what happened here. Lewandowski had to intervene to protect his candidate from his three biggest phobias all coming together at once. His intense fear of being touched, his hatred of women, and his hostility to the press. Now that's the security guard who's on it. Oh, and Trump got Lewandowski a lawyer, a guy who had to resign as a U.S. attorney after he bit a dancer while running up a $900 tab at a strip club. Remember the Violence Against Women Act that Congress passed a while back? I think Trump may have taken that a little too literally. Today on the show, Mitt Romney's top strategist to talk about how the GOP establishment can still stop Trump. But first, let's check on Trump's latest tweets. Why is this reporter touching me as I leave a news conference? What is in her hand? David Gregory got thrown off of TV by NBC, fired like a dog. Now, he's on at CNN being nasty to me. Not nice. I have millions more votes, hundreds more Dells than Cruz or Kasich, and yet I'm not being treated properly by the Republican Party or the RNC. Wow, at CNN, has nothing but my opponents on their shows, really one-sided and unfair reporting. Maybe I shouldn't do the town hall tonight. Just released that international gangs are all over our cities. This will end when I'm president. Today on the show, I'm joined by Stuart Stevens, one of the smartest people in Republican politics. Stewart was Mitt Romney's top strategist in 2012, and before that he was one of George W. Bush's political advisors in 2000 and 2004. He's the author of several books. His next one, coming out in June, is a novel set at a brokered Republican convention. It's called The Innocent Have Nothing to Fear. Donald Trump doesn't like Stewart, and you can look that up on Twitter, and uh, vice versa, I think. Uh, Stewart, welcome to the show. Thank you very much, Jacob. That's uh... I hope that doesn't go down in my obit as uh, as much of an achievement. Not 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 being liked by Donald Trump because uh, that, that would be a very broad category. Uh, so you you thought that Trump would be easy to beat, Stuart, and so did I. Why were we so wrong about that? Well, um, it's 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 a good question. I, I think that. One of the keys in which this primary was played was uh, an assumption, as it turned out, that running for president was a lot easier than it is. I think, frankly, a lot of these candidates looked at the primary that Mitt Romney went through, and they thought, well, this can't be that hard. And, in fact, it's incredibly difficult. And if you go back to 2012, you know, two guys who knew a whole lot about running for president, Mitch Daniels and Haley Barber, took a hard look at running for president and decided not to run. (laughs) So I think that there was an underestimation of the difficulty of the task. And I think a kind of mass hysteria uh, took over the field with this uh, 
lane theory of politics, that it was more important to win your lane than to win the race, which, uh, you know, I just completely don't understand. It was like tulip mania or something. And look, you've got to say, uh, you know, the, the civilized world raised a vast army and entrusted it with the Bush super PAC. And in, instead of fighting the barbarian wars, they decided to fight largely the civilized world. Can you talk just a little more, Stuart, about the sort of demographics of, of Trump? I mean, the claim here is that he can attract voters, you know, maybe white working class voters who haven't voted Republican in previous elections, didn't vote for Mitt Romney. Is that, is that, do you think that's plausible? Yeah, there's really no evidence of that. So, so let's just run through those numbers. So in 1980, uh, Ronald Reagan won 44 states by getting 57 percent of the white vote. In 2012, Mitt Romney got 59 percent of the white vote and won 24 states. Now, you could say, well, and which is often said uh, by people who haven't really looked at the numbers, well, that means that Romney didn't really gin up conservative votes, meaning white votes, as much as Ronald Reagan did. Nope, that's not true. A higher percentage of white votes of white voters uh, turned out for uh, Romney at 64 percent than Reagan at 59 percent. But it's a shrinking share of the electorate overall. It's a shrinking share of the electorate. You know, this is what I call the lost tribes of the Amazon. <laughs> uh, you know, that, that, that's, that some you know Republicans cling to, that if, if we just paddle up the river far enough and bang the drum loudly enough, you know, these lost tribes of white voters will come to the riverbank. Um, they're not there. That country, uh, demographically, does not exist. So if you want, you know, we can go out and win these states, and, and Republicans in the last eight years, in many ways, uh, they've been the best years for the party in the party's history. We've won more state legislators, more governor's races, more Senate races, uh, control of the House. You know, President Obama uh, he has not focused on building the party, and he's in many ways been a disaster. But when you get to winning a national election, which is not an insignificant thing for a party, I think on many levels, a governance level, I think on a moral level, you have to be able to represent get a larger share of non-white voters. But hasn't Trump shown us, Stuart, that there's a, a gap between people in the party elite like you who want to bring minorities into the party and are free trade and want to reduce government, and the people who actually vote Republican who are nationalistic, anti-immigrant, not particularly free market, and definitely don't want their benefits cut? Well, look, I think you can't lump all those issues together. Um, you know, the trade issue is a very complicated issue, and if you look at, at Trump's position on trade, he's really to the left of Bernie Sanders. You know, he wants to get rid of NATO, um, I mean, uh, NAFTA, and impose a 45% tariff. I mean, if he were to run, he would be campaigning with Democratic senators, and really to the left of a lot of these Democratic you senators. You class that as a Democratic view, because, you know, it's the unions and so on have been opposed to it, but there, but there is clearly a, a base of Republican voters, and these are, I think, mostly white working class voters who are nationalists on trade, who don't believe in trade. They've been voting Republican, but they don't agree with now, Republicans. Listen, I, trade is a very complicated issue, and you can look at the numbers, and it's been difficult to find support for NAFTA when you get more than a couple of hundred miles away from a border. If you, if you test NAFTA in Texas, it tests great when you're near the border. So people who live with it support it. Yeah, yes. they believe in it. They see it. They feel it. Um, the same if you test it, you know, in, in northern states. But otherwise, uh, it, it, it's never tested well. And you've always seen that there it was an opening there. It, it's, it's a very difficult emotional issue. It has always been. That is separate, I think, than, uh, but linked to uh, the immigration issue. Now, I think what is distinct about the way Trump has addressed the immigration issue is the way in which he has brought racism into it. And I think that he has crossed the line on this. I think it is absolutely abhorrent to refer to our southern neighbors as racist. You cannot say Mexicans come across and start referring to them as rapists. It is completely unacceptable to be able to do this and to try to have weave together some social fabric in America as it exists today. 
I guess I gave the the Republican Party a little too much credit. I thought there was this kind of establishment that was sort of policing the party for extremes of native nativism, racism, xenophobia. You know, there was like some William F. Buckley, Wizard of Oz in the background that said there is a line you can't cross. And there were candidates who maybe crossed it a little bit like Pat Buchanan, but we haven't seen one of them get anywhere near this far for, for I, decades and decades. Yeah, I don't blame the media for this. I blame the candidates who ran against Trump. I mean, it's really their responsibility to look Donald Trump in the eye and say, you are a ridiculous candidate who is saying ridiculous things, who is disgracing the process of running for president. Running for president is a privilege. Being president is the ultimate privilege. But just standing on the stage as a presidential candidate is a great honor. And he hadn't prepared for it. He could have prepared for it. He didn't prepare for it. And he disgraced the process. And someone should have looked him in the eye in the very first debate and said, Donald, you're a ridiculous candidate. I think Ted Cruz had great conservative credentials and should have disqualified him as a conservative from the very beginning. So you think they, they were just a little too late? I mean, Jeb Bush tried to do that in a dignified way. He did, Jeb Bush did it. I think, I think uh, Jeb, to his credit, did it more so than anyone else. Um, I think it would have been a great help if Jeb Bush had been backed up by his super PAC. He wasn't backed up by his super PAC um, to, to the degree he should have been. You know, the reality is that Trump was getting so much free media that uh, it was very difficult to fight him just in free media. You needed a super PAC to fight it out in these campaigns. But in these debates, you needed to stand there, look him in the eye, and challenge him. This is what Mitt Romney did in the very first debate when Rick Perry entered uh, the contest riding high based on his job records. And Romney, respectfully, but uh, very pointedly, in fact, they said, your job record isn't that good. George Bush's was better. And by the way, mine was better in Massachusetts. And that was in that first Ronald Reagan Center debate. And it was the beginning of the unraveling of the Perry candidacy. And that's how you win a contest. And you have to go at the core of why a candidate is running. And I think this sort of nibbling around the edges of Trump never worked. You had to go to really the core of it. And the core of it is that he's a ridiculous candidate. Yeah. Do you think there's still a Republican strategy for stopping Trump before the convention? Is that even possible now? Listen, you know, you wake up every day in a new world with Donald Trump. I mean, in the last 24 hours, Donald Trump is the first presidential candidate, uh, uh, certainly that I can remember, and I think in our lifetime, um, who has given a full-throated defense of violence against women. That's really what he's doing when he's defending his campaign manager. The talking points that he's using are the, are the talking points that you use to defend domestic and workplace violence. It, it's, it's, I think, the most despicable display of someone running for president since David Dukran. And that, we didn't live in that world two days ago, and now we live in this world. So it's very difficult to, to guess what is going to happen. You have to get the 1,237 delegates to win the nomination. If you don't have 1,237 delegates, you haven't won the nomination. It's very simple. So he's not at 1,237. So, yes, there is definitely uh, a chance for the party to nominate someone else other than Donald Trump. Look, in, in 1976, Ronald Reagan, you know, no slouch uh, in Republican Party hierarchy, took a sitting Republican president to the convention and almost beat him. So there shouldn't be any shame in going to an open convention here. So, Stuart, I know your, your novel deals with this, but let's talk about an open Republican convention or a contested convention. What happens? Trump gets there without 1,237 delegates. What do you think are some realistic scenarios of what could happen? Well, you know, I've always thought that the most realistic scenario would be what happens like when you play risk. You, you form alliances. And you have uh, Rubio delegates and you have Cruz delegates and you have Kasich delegates it seems to me, and you have some Bush delegates, it seems to me that the most likely scenario would be that two two people would form tickets. You know, that you would have like a Cruz Rubio ticket or a Cruz Kasich ticket. Or, you know, you've got to say uh, for Trump, you know, like a Trump Cruz ticket. That'll that'll be easy. That'll be an easy dispute to make up. You can uh, you can broker that one. I mean, it's uh, <laughs> and, and, and the rest of the day. This, I'll, this peace talks. I would I would like to be on a fly in the wall. Yeah, a fly the, the wall. This peace talks. I'll work out that little mid east crisis. Um, <laughs> 
I, I just think that that's the most logical way that it would happen. Now, logic and politics, you know, often have nothing to do with each other. But uh, that, that, that's one scenario. Another scenario is you go to a first ballot, no one wins. Um, the rules of the convention are complicated, but there are rules. And then you would go to a second uh, ballot, and most of these delegates would then become unbound, and that's when theoretically another candidate could be placed in nomination who hadn't run in the primary process. I've always found that the most unlikely of scenarios, though. So, Stuart, do you th- what do you think the chances are that the party fractures over this, either at the convention or following the convention? This essentially that what's now the Republican Party becomes two different parties. Um, I, I think it's uh, it's increasingly high. Well, what is a party? You have to ask yourself that. I mean, a party is basically just an, a group of free as- people who associate together with like-minded goals. There's nothing in the Constitution about parties. There are no formal organizations per se. So I, I think that a lot of people are going to find themselves unable and unwilling and uh, not wanting to support Donald Trump if he is a nominee. So what does that mean? You're, you're one of them, right? Well, I mean, yeah, I so if support uh, Donald Trump in a million years, you know, what I, do I you do Donald if, Trump, if Trump's I think the nominee? Donald Trump is a dangerous person. Um, who, for if nothing else other than emotional reasons, is uniquely unqualified to be president of the United States. So uh, there's a lot of talk of uh, there being a third party. Um, there could be. I would suspect that there would be. I think that a uh, for conservatives to have a third party candidate that you could be proud of would be a positive option and could help save the Senate for Republicans. But an anti-Trump conservative couldn't even get on the ballot in a lot of states at this point, right? I mean, realistically... No, you, you could. You could. It's, it's mm. different state by state, and there's different options. There's different parties. that there's, there's different scenarios for that to play out. But listen, I, I think the thing to focus on now for Republicans is not nominating Donald Trump. Do, Donald Trump is an absolute disaster, uh, most importantly for the country. I mean, even now running, he's hurting the country because he's degrading the process of running for president. And as a president, he would be an utter disaster for the country and I think, you know, in a larger sense, the world. Stuart Stevens is the former chief political strategist for the Mitt Romney campaign and the author of the upcoming book, The Innocent Have Nothing to Fear. That's out in June. Stuart, thanks for joining me today. Okay, buddy. It's great to talk to you. Uh, That's it for today's episode of Trumpcast. Tell us what you think of the show by giving us a rating and review on iTunes. I have a lot of five-star ratings. I also have a lot of one-star ratings that might be supporters of you-know-who. Anyhow, don't forget to hit subscribe so you get every episode as soon as we release it. You can find me on Twitter at Jacob Wee. Trumpcast is produced by Henry Malofsky and Jason DeLeon. Slate's executive producer is Steve Lichtai. Andy Bowers is our chief content officer. These tweets were recorded by John DiDomenico. John, this is a warning for you. Stop trying to touch me at my press conferences. I don't appreciate it. And today, I'll leave you with this classic clip from the 2011 White House Correspondents' Dinner. I was sitting about 10 feet from Donald Trump. He was not enjoying it. I'm Jacob Weisberg. Thanks for listening. Donald Trump (laughs) is here tonight. Now, I know that he's taken some flack lately, but no one is happier, no one is prouder to put this birth certificate matter to rest than the Donald. And that's because he can finally get back to focusing on the issues that matter. Like, did we fake the moon landing? What really happened in Roswell? And where are Biggie and Tupac? In every city, she encouraged them to enjoy what she called the cheerful hurly-burly of city life. In every town. And now we've just been around long enough, and the town looks so much better. There are people who want to change things. And I thought, oh my gosh, that is so cool. Why can't we do that in my community and other communities everywhere to make them better my point to them is it can be better it can be better than that 
it'll be different. Or to protect things from getting worse. If you're a responsible person, you have to oppose things that are dumped right on your neighborhood, right in an area that you know about. I'm Rebecca Shear, inviting you to check out Placemakers, the podcast from Slate Magazine about the spaces we inhabit and the people who shape them. Subscribe now to Placemakers. You'll never look at your community the same way again.